more than a decade ago. And, and their suggestion was that vector spaces associated to knots that had been introduced by Ubri and Papa were related to what appears in Kovanov homology. Later on, I re-expressed this type of construction in terms of gauge theory and the counting of solutions of PDEs. And that's the story that I'll describe today. I've given a number of previous lectures on this that have been written up. So, well, there are two versions on the archive. Actually, this one is more complete. I decided to take a different approach today for several reasons. One is I'm a little bit tired of the previous lectures. Second is that I actually gave a previous version of them at Penn a couple years ago. And some of you may have heard them either here or elsewhere. So, um, I'm not certain whether it's new and improved, but it's a, at least it's a different approach today. So in any event, the goal is to describe invariance of the knot embedded in three-dimensional space. In the simplest version, the invariance will be obtained by counting with signs the solution of an equation. The solutions will have an integer value topological invariant, what I'll call p. And if an is the number of solutions with p equals n, then the Jones polynomial of the knot will be simply a Lamont series with the an as coefficients. We count solutions algebraically, meaning that if a root has multiplicity n, we count it with the integer n. And if the, then there's something that happens in the real world, solutions can contribute with either a plus or minus one, involving the sign of the determinant of the linearization of the equation at a solution. So, the number of, in general, the number of solutions of an equation can only be an invariant if you count this number algebraically. And in the case of the equation I'll describe, the algebraic counts are supposed to lead to the Jones polynomial. Now, to get Kovanov homology, this situation is supposed to be categorified, which means that for every integer n, we're supposed to define a complex of vector spaces whose Euler characteristic is a sub n. Now, in general, as far as I know, count the basic case in which you can categorify the counting of solutions of an equation is that the equation of solutions you're counting is the equation for critical points of some Morse function. So we will eventually be in that situation, but not only near the end of the talk. Now, our equations will be PDEs. So H will be a Morse function on an infinite dimensional space, namely the space that parameterizes all the variables that appear in the PDE. So h will be a function of the functions that appear in the PDE. And our equation will be the equations for critical points of h. And that counting of critical points can be categorified, which would get Kovanov homology. But we're going to put aside categorification until near the end of the talk. And I'll just describe what goes into I'll just assume we're trying to describe the Jones polynomial. Now, the equations whose solutions I claim we should count to describe the Jones polynomial and Kovanov homology might look ad hoc if written down without any explanation. And I could start by explaining the physical setup, but possibly not everyone would find that equally helpful. So instead I'll follow a different approach of motivating the equations from what appears in an established mathematical approach to Kovanov homology called symplectic Kovanov homology. So if you like, we'll interpret symplectic Kovanov homology in terms of certain PDEs in four and five dimensions. Now, going all the way back to the original work of Von Jones 30 some years ago, most approaches to the Jones polynomial define an invariant in terms of some presentation of the knot, for instance, a projection to a plane, or some other knot presentation. You define something that's manifestly well-defined once a presentation is given. What one defines is not obviously independent of the presentation, but it turns out to be. And that's where the magic is. The magic in the Jones polynomial, in any, in any traditional definition, is that something you can explicitly calculate in terms of a not presentation turns out for relatively mysterious reasons to actually be independent of the presentation. And in such approaches, there always is some magic. Meaning, 
that it's not to, it, you can prove that it works, but it's not too obvious why it works. An approach based on counting solutions of PDs has the opposite advantages and drawbacks. Topological invariance is potentially manifest. Given certain generalities about elliptic PDs, but it may not be clear that you can calculate. The ideal is to have manifest three, or in the categorical case, four-dimensional symmetry, together with the method of calculation. So how might we accomplish this? Well, there's kind of a standard strategy uh, for problems of counting solutions of PDs, which goes back, I think, to the Atiyah Jones conjecture concerning the instant non equation in four dimensions. So the strategy is uh, to stretch a knot in one direction. So we followed the strategy, the work I did with David and Ray Coyoto a few years ago. So here I've just drawn a knot presentation, but now the knot has been stretched in one direction, and that direction has been called U, or parameterized by a real variable U. So this is a knot that's almost independent of U except at the end. <clears throat> then, you want it to be the case that except near the end, the solutions are independent of you. That's not automatically the case. That's why the Theo Jones conjecture of Fumish was a conjecture originally. And Gaiotto and I had to make a perturbation to get to a situation in which this would be true. In the most simple version of the problem, it wasn't true. So we had to make a perturbation to find a version of the problem where if we stretch a knot in one direction, the solutions become independent of you except near the ends. Well, however, assuming you accomplish this, then you define a space of u independent solutions. You can think of these as solutions in the presence of infinite long strands that extend forever in the u direction. In other words, the idea is that in the presence of infinite long strands that go on forever parallel lines in R3, these solutions that don't blow up on exponentially at infinity, or don't blow up badly at infinity, are actually independent of u and reduced to solutions of equations in one dimension less. Now, suppose, however, we have some strands that are only semi-infinite. Then, in the space of u and <coughs> solutions, we define a subspace L sub L consisting of solutions that extend over the left. Well, for simplicity in my terminology, I assume a solution extends in at least one way. But we don't really need that assumption. In general, L sub L would be the space of solutions in the semi-infinite situation. And we'd like it to map to M, because a semi-infinite solution is supposed to be independent of U when U is large and positive. But for simplicity, I'll imagine that, <coughs> that every solution extends into most one way. So L sub L is a subspace of M consisting of solutions that extend over the left. Similarly, although I think I didn't draw it, we let L sub R parameterize solutions that extend over the right, where I somehow ended the picture on the right with some kind of right half knot. So then for a global knot with strands ending on both ends, the solutions are solutions <coughs> in the middle that extend over both ends. So then the global solutions are intersection points of L sub L and L sub R. The integer a m that appears as a coefficient in the Jones polynomial is supposed to be the algebraic intersection number of L sub L and L sub R. To be more exact, A sub N is this intersection number computed by counting only intersections that have the right topology. So, the original Atiyah Jones conjecture, by the way, it's a different Jones from the Jones of the Jones polynomial. But anyway, the original Atiyah Jones conjecture said that the Cassin and Brain of a knot can be computed by this kind of procedure. Now, in the language, so by the way, so what does all this have to do with mirror symmetry and what and the Foucault category and why are we talking about? 
in the continents on, uh, on this topic, apart from the fact that this is the closest I could come to a lecture that was relevant. Well, so A sub n is the intersection number, but now we want to define a complex whose Euler characteristic will be A sub n. So in other words, we want to categorify the intersections between two sub manifolds. In this language of intersections, categorification can happen if M is a symplectic manifold, and L sub L and L sub R are Lagrangian submanifolds. Then for cohomology, in other words, the A model with the Fukaya category of M, gives a framework for categorification. And that will be the candidate Jones cohomology. Oh, sorry, Kavano cohomology. Now, from the point of view of today's lecture, the reason all this happened is that even before we stretched the knots to reduce the intersections, the equations whose solutions we are counting are equations for critical points of some function. And that gives an underlying reason that categorification should be possible. But in the stretched version, it will turn into the categorification in the Foucault category. Now, in symplectic Kovano homology, a version of such a story is developed for Kovano homology, at least in a singly graded version. So, technically, at least so far, it's carried out in a way that. Well, those of you familiar with Kovano homology will know what this phrase means, but if you're not, never mind. But anyway, there's a version of this that's done for Kovano homology with a very specific M. So, we're going to have to use PDEs that in some way are related to this M. So, so I gave various references at the beginning to some like the Kovano homology, but a description of the M that we use, that's not the original one, but it was proposed by Kamnitzer and was an important clue in my work is as follows. M can be understood as a space of Hecke modifications. So let me explain this concept. So in this discussion, C is going to be a Riemann circle. And G will be a simple E group, but I'll refer to its complex form as G sub C. G without the subscript will be the compact form, which will later be a gauge group. So E will be a holomorphic G bundle over C, G sub C bundle over C, where G sub C is a complex simple E group. A key modification B at a point in C is another holomorphic bundle over C. That, that has a given isomorphism to E away from P. It's not just that E prime is abstractly isomorphic to E away from P. An isomorphism between them is part of the structure of giving a Hecke modification. What it means to give a Hecke modification of E and P is to give E prime together with an isomorphism away from P. For example, if GC is just the abelian group C star, we can think of E as a holomorphic line bundle over C. And then you could ask, what are the holomorphic line bundles that are isomorphic to L if a given point P is omitted? The answer to that question is that a holomorphic line bundle L prime that has a natural isomorphism to L away from P is obtained from L by twisting by O of P to the N for some integer N, where O of P is the line bundle of sections or functions that might have simple poles of P. There's an integer n that comes in here. And in view of the generalization that we'll get to in a moment, to non-abelian groups, you should think of n as a weight of the Langlands GNO dual group of C star, which is another copy of C star. So the reason I write G sub C to make explicit the complex form is that when we do gauge theory, the gauge group will be the compact real form which I will simply call G. In general, for any G, simple compact Lie group G, there's a corresponding dual group G check with complexification G check sub C, such that Hecke modifications of a GC bundle IP occur in families that are classified by dominant weights or equivalently finite dimensional representations of the dual group. Here it doesn't matter if we refer to the compact or complex form of the dual group. For example, if GC is GL2C, 
we could think of a GC bundle as a rank 2 complex bundle E over C. The last one's GNO dual group is again GL2C. And a Hecke modification dual to the two dimensional representation of the dual group is as follows. I won't try to explain it in the most intrinsic way, just in the one I can say guesses. For some local decomposition of O as of E, rather, as O plus O, as, in other words, for some trivialization of E as the direct sum of two trivial bundles, E prime is O of P plus O. So that's a typical example of Hecke modification dual to the two-dimensional representation of the dual group. And uh, <coughs> but there's a difference from the Abelian case, which is that in the Abelian case, there was a unique Hecke modification of a given type, tensoring by O of P to the N. But in the non-Abelian case, we had to pick a decomposition of E before doing this. So as a result, there's not just one Hecke modification of this type of P, but a whole family of them arising from the choice of decomposition of E as O plus O. <coughs> because of the dependence on that decomposition, or more accurately, the dependence on the choice of a subbundle O that's going to be replaced by O of P, the Hecke modifications <coughs> of this type of P form a family parameterized by CP1. That's an example, a simple example, of a family of Hecke modifications of a fixed type. These were Hecke modifications of the type corresponding to a minuscule weight of the dual group. And the family was just a copy of CP1. Now, I've plotted sort of the complex plane, which we'll think of as R2. I mean, our, the complex plane is meant to be the screen. Uh, we've picked some points that are labeled. And now we're going to make Hecke modifications of this type of a trivial rank 2 complex bundle over C. Well, it's a local notion, because when you make a Hecke modification, part of the rule is that you don't change the bundle away from one point. You're given an isomorphism to the ultimate away from that point. So the moduli space for all these Hecke modifications is just a product of a local factor at each point, and the local factor is CP1. So the space of all such Hecke modifications is a copy of CP1 to the 2n with one copy of CP1 at each point. However, CP1 to the 2n has a natural subvariety m, which is defined as follows. First of all, we add a point at infinity to the fact by c to CP1. So now we're making Hecke modifications of a trivial bundle over CP1. Every time we make one of these Hecke modifications, well, a point in CP1 to the 2n determines a way to make Hecke modifications of 2n points to make a new bundle E prime. Each of these Hecke modifications increases the degree by 1, so E prime has degree 2n. And therefore, generically, E prime is going to be O of n plus O of n. So, and if we twist by O of minus N times the point at infinity, we generically will get a trivial bundle. But that's only true generically. So N is defined by requiring that this twisted version of E prime should be trivial. If we were working in PGL2 rather than GL2, we would just say that E prime should be trivial. But then some other statements would have been trivial. So I've given you uh, an illustration of the kind of space we're talking about. It's the space of Hecke modifications from a trivial bundle to itself of specified types at a given set of points. So in this particular example, it's the complement of hypersurface in CP1 to the 2n. Symplectic cohomology is constructed by considering intersections of Lagrangian submanifolds of this space M with multiple Hecke modifications from a trivial bundle to itself. But that's a description that leads to magic later on. Because it's not obvious why something that was the four Fukaya category of this space would have three or four dimensional symmetry. To explain better the three or four dimensional symmetry, 
We want to understand them as a space of solutions of some gauge theory, PDEs. And then the symmetry will be easier to understand. So in my work with Kaposin on gauge theory and geometric line lines, an important fact was that M can be realized as a moduli space of solutions of a certain set of PDEs. <clears throat> but there's a trick which will therefore be repeated in the rest of the lecture. Although M is defined in terms of bundles on a two-manifold, the PDEs are in three dimensions, on R3. That might come as a surprise, but it actually gives an explanation of some things, uh, some properties of moduli spaces of Hecke modifications that have been discovered by other methods, but which are maybe more obvious than the three-dimensional point here. But because of the fact that we shift in dimension from two to three in interpreting M as a space of solutions of PDEs, everything in the rest of the lecture will be in a dimension that's one more than you might have expected. So we'll count four-dimensional solutions to get the Jones polynomial and five-dimensional solutions to get Kofan optimology. The three-dimensional PDEs that we need are, are, are actually well known. For example, Atiyah and Hitchin wrote a book about them in the 1980s, and a lot of, there's been a lot of well-known mathematical work on them. They're known as the Bogomolny equations. They're equations for pair A and phi, where A is a connection on a G bundle over a three-manifold, well, an oriented three-dimensional environment manifold. And phi is a section of the corresponding adjoint bundle. So, physicists would just say, this is a fine natural value of zero point. So if f equals dA plus a with j is the curvature of a, then the Bogomolny equations are like so. Where star is the Hodge star and d sub a is the gauge covering exterior derivative. Now, the Bogomolny equations have lots of remarkable properties, which you can't do justice to at the time we've got today. So I'm only going to tell you about one aspect. We'll consider the bulk of all equations on a three-manifold that is R times C, where C is a Riemann surface. In our application, C will really just be R2, but it could be any Riemann surface. So any connection on a G bundle over C determines a holomorphic structure on E, or more exactly what it's classification. You simply write the exterior derivative as a D bar operator as a 0, 1, and 1, 0 piece and use the zero one piece to define the complex structure. Since we're in complex dimension one, there's no integrability condition on a D-bar operator. So any A will do. And any connection defines a homomorphic structure. So that means that if Y is a point in R, and we restrict the bundle over R times C to the corresponding bundle over Y times C. Remember, E being a bundle with connection, in fact, the solution is the bulk of one. <coughs> we get in a natural way a homomorphic bundle E sub Y over C. We just take the smooth bundle E Y, restrict its connection to Y times C. We take the zero one part of that restriction, and that gives us our D bar operator. So, restriction E sub y of E to y times C always has a natural homework construction. But if the bulk of one equations are satisfied, E sub y is canonically independent of y as a homework bundle. That's because the consequence of the bulk of equations is that D bar A is independent of y, it should be, of R to R, up to conjugation. So that's the bulk of one equation tell us that the covariant derivative of the y direction when it's y times phi commuted to d bar a is zero. So you can read that to say that the ordinary derivative of d bar a is something commuted to d bar a. So up to conjugacy, or in other words, up to a complex gauge transformation or a homomorphic bundle automorphism, d bar a is independent of y. It's really an immediate consequence of the bulk of one equation. In fact, it's equivalent to two-thirds of the Bolgamoni equations. Bolgamoni equations can be written as a complex equation 
which is this one, plus a moment in that condition. So one expects that this condition, one's in a situation where one expects that the holomorphic data up to holomorphic equivalence will give you the moduli space of solutions of the original unitary equations. Now, the next thing we have to know is that the Bogomolny equations admit solutions with the singularity or singularities at isolated points in R3, or in a more general three manifold W3. I'll first describe the picture for the abelian group U1. One fixes an integer n, and one observes that the Bogomolny equation has an exact solution for any point in R3. <coughs> so, phi is just n over 2 times the Euclidean distance from x0, and f is star of d phi. Phi was picked to be a harmonic, so a star of d phi is a going to be a closed 2 form. Now, we want a line bundle with connection as curvature is that closed 2 form. <coughs> well, such a line bundle with connection will exist if the periods are integer multiples of 2 pi. And that translates into n being an integer. So therefore, the ball Kumon equations for u1 have a solution of this kind for every integer n. I only, I only wrote f, the curvature, and not the connection, which has that curvature. But such a line bundle and connection exists if n is an integer. Now, for u1, since the ball Kumon equations are linear, they have a unique solution with singularities labeled by defined integers at specified points in R3. I've labeled some points in R3, we've labeled them by integers, and we just add up the solutions I told you about with those integer coefficients. But we're interested in the case that the sum of the integers is zero, because we will want solutions that vanish at infinity faster than one over x. And the code sum of the integers being zero kills the leading term at infinity in these solutions and makes sure that the solution vanishes faster than one over x. <coughs> so we pick a decomposition of R3 as R times R2, or we identify R2 as C, the complex plane. Suppose the singularities are yi times pi, where well, yi is in R and pi is in C. Well, as long as y, so if we project to the real axis, there's some bad points that lie underneath some of these singularities. I've called the bad points y1 up to yn. If y is not one of the bad points, then the indicated solution of the Bogomolny equations determines a homomorphic line bundle Ly over C. Because if y is not a bad point, then the solution is regular on y times r2, or in other words, on y times c. And this solution will extend to a line bundle over cp1, because we made sure that the solution vanishes at infinity faster than 1 over x. The purpose of this solution vanishing at infinity faster than 1 over x was to make sure we could always extend over cp1. So for every y that is not one of the bit special values, we get a holomorphic line bundle over CP1. Now, because the Bogomolny equations are big, Ly is constant up to isomorphism if Y is not one of the YI. But even when Y crosses one of the YI, Ly is constant when restricted to CP1 minus PI. Because if I, there are bad horizontal projections, vertical projections, but there are bad horizontal projections. So if I throw away r times pi, then nothing would happen along the fiber as y changes. So our holomorphic bundle is constant in a natural way when restricted to cp1 minus pi. But it's not constant if you include pi. In other words, in crossing Ly sub i, Ly undergoes a Hecke modification. And that Hecke modification has got to be twisting by O of pi to some integer. And in this case, we know what the integer is because of the first term class. <coughs> the singularity had a first term class of anode. So Ly is twisted by O of pi to the anode. 
Now, it's also true that Ly is trivial at minus infinity and plus infinity. Why is that? Well, again, it's true because the solution vanishes at infinity faster than 1 over x. That ensures that the bundle is trivial way back here and also way over here. So, the solution of the Borgamoni equations with these singularities describes a sequence of Hecumor equations, mapping the trivial bundle to itself. Of course, it was a lot of work to do that this way in the Abelian case. But we can do something similar for any simple E group G. And this involves a construction. Physicists call it what I'll be describing as the hoofed operators. It's important in physical applications of quantum theory. So let T be the maximal torus of G, and let script T, this kind of T, be its Lie algebra. Then we pick a homomorphism rho from the Lie algebra of U1 to T. Up to a while transformation, such a rho is equivalent to a dominant weight of the dual group, so it corresponds to a representation R check of the dual group G check. We turn the singular solution of the E1 Bogomolny equations that we used before with n equals 1. We take the basic solution for n equals 1. We turn it into a singular solution for G simply by taking U1 and embedding it in the algebra of G by a row. <coughs> so for, all I'm telling you is that for any U1 valued solution of any reasonable equations, I'm being a little bit too flippant. Of, for any gauge three equations of this kind that are constructed using covariant derivatives and homomorphisms only. If you have a homomorphism from one group to another, you can embed the solution in some bigger group, or conceivably a smaller group, depending on the homomorphism. But in this case, we pick an embedding, so we embed a U1 solution as a singular solution of the Bogomolny equations for G. Then we look for solutions of the Bogomolny equations for G with singularities of this type at specified points yi times pi in R3. So the picture is the same as before, but the points, rather than being labeled by integers, are labeled by representations of the dual group. Of course, we could have, in the Abelian case, interpreted the integers as representations of the dual group. So <clears throat> we need to use the language of representation to tell that the picture is the same. Also, now we have to specify that the solution should go to infinity, zero infinity, faster than one over all. In the Abelian case, we can just say that the sum of the n's is zero, and that's equivalent to the solution vanishing at infinity faster than one over all. But in the non-Abelian case, there's no equally simple criteria, and we just have to say that the solutions we want are the ones that vanish at infinity faster than one over all. Given this, by the same arguments as in the Abelian case, such a solution describes a sequence of Hecke modifications of type pi, sorry, at the points pi of type rho i, mapping a trivial bundle over CP1 to itself. <coughs> the moduli space M of solutions of these equations with indicated singularities vanishing at infinity faster than one of R is actually a hypercanonical. Essentially, first studied by Peter Feynman in the 1980s. If we pick a decomposition of R3 as R times R2, this picks one of the complex structures of the hypergamma model. And in that complex structure, M is what I've told you, the modular space of Hecke modifications of indicated types of indicated points, mapping a trivial bundle over CP1 to itself. So this construction can be used to account for a number of properties of spaces and Hecke modifications. But for today, we want to head toward knob theory, so we won't talk more about those spaces for their own sake. But we want to focus on the fact that for applications of knob theory, we want M to be the space of U-independent solutions of some equations. So M was constructed with point singularities, but now, we add another variable that I'll call u, and we will want equations that have line singularities. <coughs> 
And since we already were in three dimensions, we will now be in four dimensions. So we will want some four dimensional PDs that admit natural class of solutions with line singularities and with the property that in a situation that's independent of one direction, the reasonable solutions will be independent of that direction. We already described M by solutions of PDs on R3. So now we have to think of M as a space of U-independent solutions on R3 times R, in other words, on R4, where the second factor R is parameterized by U. <coughs> so now we need to write down some PDs in four dimensions. There actually are natural PDs in four dimensions at work, which some authors have called the KW equations. They appeared in my work with Kabustin on geometric lines. There are equations for a pair A and lambda, where A is a connection on a G bundle of the world form manifold, and lambda is a one form valued in the other. The equations look a little bit like Hitchens equations. Well, I've written them so they have the same form as Hitchens equations. Except, except they were in four dimensions instead of two. <clears throat> what I said wasn't correct. They look suspiciously like the Hitchens equations, but the four dimensional Hodge star is. So, they're not, if, if you literally took Hitchens equations and wrote the same thing in four dimensions, you'd say that the left and right hand sides were both zero. We're not saying that, we're just saying that the left and right hand sides are equal. So, they're reminiscent of Hitchens equations. And they have a truncation, in fact, several different truncations that give Hitchens equations. But if we brutally wrote down Hitchens equations for a one form and a gauge field in four dimensions, they wouldn't be elliptic. These equations, which are a little bit stronger than those, people, are elliptic PDs. So these four dimensional equations have different reductions to a lot of familiar equations in mathematical physics. But in particular, in the case that y4 is a 3 manifold times r, that a is a pullback from w3, and phi is a one form in the r direction, so to speak. These equations reduce to the Bogomolny equations. So the singular solutions of the Bogomolny equations that we've talked about can be embedded as singular solutions of the KW equations, but now with the singularity along the line rather than the points. So if Y4 is a four manifold and S is an embedded one manifold, labeled by homomorphism from U1 to the maximal torus, or equivalently by a representation of the dual group, then one can look for solutions of the KW equations with the singularity of the indicated type along S. And that's actually an elliptic problem. If we specialize to the case that Y4 is a three manifold times R, and one manifold is a union of parallel strands in the R direction, in other words, a union of factors, sometimes SI, which are points W3 times R, in other words, if we specialize for this picture, then the U-independent solutions are parameterized by the moduli space of Hecke modifications that I told you about before. And one can show that these are all solutions of the KW equations in this situation with reasonable behavior at the So we have an elliptic PV in four dimensions. And we can specify in an interesting sort of way, interesting way, what sort of singularity it should have on an embedded circle. But if you're following me closely and you remember that we wanted an up here, this might sound ridiculous. This sounds like a ridiculous framework for not doing, because there is no knottedness of a one manifold in a four manifold. So what are we talking about? 
Well, there are a couple of things I've left out. And therefore, there are a couple of possible ways to continue the lecture. So there are a few directions we could go, but I'm going to head for categorification, which will also resolve the point I just mentioned. Because in order to categorify, we shall have to place a restriction on the problem as I defined it. As I said it so far, it was an embedded one manifold and a four manifold. But for the categorified version, it will be more restricted and not period over here. <coughs> so now we have to discuss what's our framework for categorification. And for this, we're going to start with an ordinary equation rather than a partial differential equation. Suppose we're on a finite dimensional compact oriented manifold n with a real vector bundle whose rank is equal to the dimension of n. And we're given a section S of this bundle. So now we consider the equation S equals 0. And we can define an integer by counting with multiplicities the zeros of S. In other words, the solutions of the equation S equals 0. So as I think you all know, counting with multiplicities in this situation includes counting with signs, as I said at the beginning of the lecture. This integer that is obtained by pro a proper count of solutions is the integral of RAM of the Euler class of the bundle. So that's an integer invariant of this situation. In general, as far as I know, there's no way to categorify the Euler class of the vector bundle. But suppose the vector bundle is the cotangent bundle and that S is the differential of the Morse function. Then, the zeros of S are critical points of H, and they have a natural categorification that's described in Morse homology. You define a complex V with a basis vector psi sub P for each critical point P of H. The complex is Z graded by assigning to psi sub P the index of the critical point P. The index is the number, you look at the matrix of second derivatives of H, it's got positive and negative eigenvalues. And P is the number of negative eigenvalues. The complex has a natural differential that's defined by counting gradient flow lines between different critical points. So the picture is this one. I've written I wrote the equation. A gradient flow line is a solution of the gradient flow equation. So to, to define what we mean by gradient flow lines, we introduce another dimension. Part of the reason I'm going through this exercise is to make sure that everyone knows that what categorification means is to introduce another dimension and obtain the structure you were already discussing from a structure in one more dimension. So this is, this is where we categorify. We add another dimension, which I'll call time, t, and now we look at a PDE. The PDE says that the XCT is minus the gradient of the Morse function, where the gradient we have to pick a Riemannian metric so that we have a notion of the gradient, so we can write this equation. But when that shows that what one gets is essentially independent of the choice of the metric. Having written this equation, you then consider the solutions from P to Q, <coughs> the solutions that started P in the far past and flow to Q at the far future, where Q has a Morse index that's one bigger than the Morse index of P. These solutions will come in one-dimensional families because uh, you can always add a constant to the time. In other words, because R has a group of trans time translations. What you count are one-parameter families of flow related by time translations. The differential on the complex is obtained defined by saying that D of psi sub P is the sum over Q of NPQ psi Q, where NPQ is the count of solutions in this situation. So what you're supposed to learn from this is A, okay, and then you show that this actually defines a complex, d squared is zero, and moreover, the homology, the complex is independent of the choices up to quasi isomorphism. In fact, it commutes the computes the Duran homology of the manifold. What you're supposed to learn from this is two things. One, if you want to categorify the problem of counting solutions of an equation, 
It should be the equation for a critical point of the Morse function. That's the first thing you should learn. And the second thing you should learn is that in general, categorification means adding another dimension and interpreting your theory in terms of a theory in one dimension more. So this tells us what we need to do to be able to categorify a problem of counting solutions of the KW equations. We have to be able to write those equations as equations for a critical point of something. So the variables that appear in the KW equations were a and phi, oh, sorry, a and lambda. I had a and phi in the bubble on the equations. The KW equations was a and lambda. Oh, sorry, I've got it perhaps here. So, the Morse function will be a function of a gauge field in a one form that will be analogous to a Lagrangian in quantum field theory. And a critical point is a solution of the Euler and Lagrange equations. Delta gamma delta A and delta gamma delta lambda should be zero. So if we want to categorify the problem of counting solutions of the KW equations, those equations have got to be equations for a critical point of something. If so, categorification will mean adding another variable time, parameterizing r, so we'll go from a 4 manifold to a 5 manifold, and then we write down the gradient flow equations, which will be these equations. And these equations had better be elliptic, because we're going to want to count their solutions. And a count of solutions of a system of PDs really only works in the elliptic case. So we need to things that are extremely non-generic in the world of PDs. First, the KW equation should be equations for a critical point of something. And second, in one dimension more, the corresponding gradient flow equation has to be elliptic. If you understand what I've said, you might realize that there are very few cases where these two facts would work. And I think all the cases where they work are actually important in mathematics, widely studied by mathematicians, except for this case, which isn't yet widely studied. So generically, it's not true that the KW equations are equations for a critical point of some function. But this is true if y4 is w3 times r for some w3. So to categorify, we can't work on an arbitrary 4 manifold. It will have to be a 3 manifold times r. And if singularities are present on an embedded 1 manifold, there's a further condition. The KW equations in this situation are equations for critical points if and only if S is contained in a 3 manifold, W3 times a point in R. So suddenly, if we want to categorify, our knots are going to have to live in three dimensions instead of four. That's good because there is not theory in three dimensions. To make categorification possible, we have to be in the situation that leads to not theory. S is an embedded one manifold in the three manifold W3. W3 contains the U direction? No, W3 is the opposite of three direction. So R is the U direction. Oh, so no. Yes, yes, W3 contains the U direction. We stretch the knot along W3. Oh, the direction orthogonal, the orthogonal direction R here. It was not very obvious why to go to the bottom one equations there was an extra dimension. So to represent modulized spaces and Hecke modifications, which in the math literature are thought of in complex dimension one or low dimension two, to describe them this way, we introduced a third dimension. And that third dimension is the dimension that's out of the three manifold that contains the model. So to make categorification possible, we have to be in the situation that leads to not theory. S is an embedded one manifold in a three manifold. So naively, this leads to categorified knot variants in any three manifold. But to justify this claim, one needs some compactness properties for solutions of the equations. And I expect that a proper proof of these compactness properties will require that the Ricci tensor is non-negative, the very restrictive condition. But there might be other things that are true. There might be other special cases that work. But a typical example that I, where I expect everything to work would be not in R3 or S3. 
Now, I haven't made any gradients explicit, except that when I discussed Morse theory, we had the Morse index, which gave a gradient of the corresponding complex. And that's the only gradient that will require set. So the theory as I've described it corresponds to what people who work on covalent ophthalmology would call singly graded covalent ophthalmology. Well, more exactly, it's supposed to correspond to that if G is PGL2 and rho corresponds to the two-dimensional representation of the dual group SL2. More of the three math models just the way through. So the only grading I've mentioned is the one associated to the Morse index, or in other words, to categorification. In the mathematical theory, one says that the singly graded covalent ophthalmology becomes trivial if you decategorify it and forget the gradient. And in my presentation, the reason that that's true is that in the decategorified theory, the knot had no reason to live in a three manifold. It lived in a four manifold, and not theory in four dimensions is trivial. So the statement of the mathematical, we had a ridiculous framework for knot theory, namely a one manifold embedded in four dimensions. And the ridiculousness of that corresponds to the mathematical statement that the decategorified, singly graded version of the theory is trivial. That's what I just said. In the approach I've described, the decategorified, singly graded theory is trivial because without categorifying, the embedded one manifold just lives in a four manifold. It has no reason to be embedded in a three manifold. So there's no knot of this. Now, the physical picture makes clear where the additional grading of covalent ophthalmology would come from. It's supposed to come from the second term mass integrated over the four manifold Y4. But for topological reasons, the Q grading can't be defined in the construction as I've presented it so far. We have, so if you have a, if you have a, for example, an SU2 bundle in a compact four manifold, it has a second term index. And a non-compact four manifold with everything vanishing at infinity is just as good. What if you allow singularities on embedded one manifolds? You discover that the second term class is no, can no longer be defined as a topological environment. So in the situation I've presented, there's no Q grade. So with these singularities, even if Y is a compact form, with the singularities I've described along the one manifold, there's no second term class as a topological environment. The physical picture gives a few suggestions about what to do, but the one that the most orthodox one is the following. Instead of Y4 being precisely what I've described, it should be a manifold with boundary, but the knot placed in its boundary. So to, to categorify, the knot had to live in a three manifold. And it, from that point of view, it could be any three manifold. But to get the, also the Q grading, the three manifold should be the boundary of a four manifold. So the picture is now like so. There's a three manifold where the knot is embedded. It's the boundary of a four manifold. And this is the uncategorified picture. In the categorified picture, there's a fifth dimension of time. The boundary condition is subtle to describe, but has the property that it trivializes the bundle on the boundary. So the second term class can be defined as an integer invariant. It's not quite an integer invariant. It's an integer invariant once the W3 is framed. So the frame, once W3 of the object. So if you're familiar with the Jones polynomial, there's a story involving the framing of an up. And that appears here because the boundary condition is a little bit too subtle to describe now. But it's not quite true that it uh, <coughs> trivializes the bundle. It gives you what the information you need to trivialize the bundle if you're given framings. And so you end up recovering the standard story about the framings of knots and three manifolds in the, in the subject of quantum knowledge. 
In work that I cited earlier, Gallardo and I analyzed the situation. In the uncategorified situation, meaning we counted solutions in four dimensions instead of five, with the aim of showing directly, without referring to the physical picture, that the Jones polynomial can be obtained by counting solutions. So in this work, we had the Q grading, but not the cohomological grading. So we, we studied the opposite part of the problem from what most of my lecture was about. As usual, our starting point was to stretch the knot in one dimension direction, reducing to equations in one dimension less. And then it turned out that the solutions in one dimension less that satisfy the boundary conditions are related to lots of interesting mathematical physics involving integral systems, geometric lines, and lots of formal field theory in two dimensions, and lots of other fun things. And we arrived at a description of the Jones polynomial that was new to us, but which we now understand is originally that of Bigelow, following earlier work by Ruth Lawrence and others. What we did, what we added was to derive this description from a starting point with manifest three-dimensional symmetry. The analog for the categorified version has not been found yet. In one version, one expects it to involve the foucault Seidel category with a certain two dimension. Thank you. Yes, I would say so. so I mean, first of all, without the knot, compactness is straightforward to prove when the Ritchie tensor is non negative. So you want to show that the knot only produces a, a bounded mistake. But you have to remember that we've got physicists talking to you. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it will work because of the underlying physical picture. I tried to give you a partial method, through, but the real reason I believe it will work is the physical picture. I couldn't quite hear the question, sir. Uh, on the monoid space of, of monopoles, monopoles in R3, they, which was also described by Donaldson as a space of rational functions. It has a lot of descriptions. There's a lot of, this subject is connected with this. These four and five dimensional equations, when you start stretching and reducing, uh, they're related to lots of things that mathematicians have studied from many different points of view in different dimensions. 